and it was just convenient. It was supposed to be temporary, and it turned into one of those permanent temporary things. And then until we finally moved uh, to New Jersey to be closer to my job, COVID hit, and I got laid off and was left with an even bigger decision. What do I do? Do I try to stay in this industry where jobs were really disappearing quickly, or take my furniture business and content business um, to the next level and, and see what I could do with it? So this is my daily trip outside, go to the mailbox, get my uh, grocery store flyer. Oh, missed something. More junk. So besides the mailbox, my other weekly routine is I go to the chiropractor every Wednesday. So that's when I actually get fresh air. Other than that, there's nothing out here for me. I'm Keith Johnson, I'm a custom furniture maker and content creator here in Northern New Jersey, better known as KJ Sawdust on Instagram and TikTok, but my wife doesn't really call me that. We lived in this old farmhouse on this 100 acre farm and there was no heat in this house. I, I feel like I grew up in the 20s, I was shoveling coal, but there was this barn in the back that had stacks of lumber and my friends and I used to grab boards out of there all the time and build tree houses in the woods. And it was just always so satisfying. At the, at the end of the day, once you build something with your hands, you step back and look. There's a great sense of pride that you have and you can just say, I built that. It's, it's very satisfying to me and rewarding. But then also when you build something for someone else, you know they have a vision in mind of what they want for their home and when you're able to build that for them and deliver it and they're so happy and it just fits exactly what they wanted, that's a huge thing for me, seeing the smile on their face and how happy that they are that they paid me to build this thing and I was able to give them kind of what they wanted. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. So I've actually been building custom furniture pieces since I was in eighth grade shop class. I remember the first thing I built was this shadow box with a glass panel for my grandmother. It was a shelving unit for little knickknacks. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. I remember building Norm Abrams Adirondack chair from his plans in his book in ninth grade. And I built an entertainment center to hold all my awesome cassette tapes in high school. And as I got more and more experience, uh, you know, back then there was no YouTube or I didn't know of any school. So everything I would learn was magazines, books, This Old House or Norm Abram on the New Yankee Workshop. So I didn't even think of furniture making as a career back then. I thought I wanted to be an architect, uh, kind of like George Costanza. I ended up in printing and um, printing and packaging. But all along while I was in corporate America, I was building furniture and just kind of honing my skills, building as much as I could. I was able to get some clients through friends. So I was able to actually make some money building furniture. And then when COVID hit, I ended up losing my job. And at that point I had built a decent enough following across social media and with sponsors and had some backlog of commissions that I was able to take this full time. So now my furniture pieces range anywhere from dining tables to small console tables. And I base all of my projects around content. Like I typically don't take a commission unless I think it's gonna make some cool content or a cool video or challenge me in any way. I wanna keep growing and learning as a furniture maker to kind of expand my offerings to my clients or anyone that, that wants a specific thing. Like, yeah, I can do that. Or even if I haven't done it, I kind of have the skills from other things that I've done that I'm able to get it done. So when I was working at my regular day job, taking some commissions and also just building things for around the house, I stumbled across Instagram and this whole woodworking community that was on there. I had no idea. If you look way back in my early Instagram posts, they were all of my nephew. They weren't of woodworking at all. And as I started to learn of this community and sticker swaps and that you could actually share your content and there were other people in garages doing the same thing I was doing, that's when I actually 
My passion for this got even more intense because when you're working alone in your garage, it can be very lonely and you just don't realize kind of what you're missing out there. It became apparent to me that there are a ton of other people out there just like me who want to connect and learn from each other and grow and be inspired. As I started to post on Instagram, I started to gain a following. I started to take more process videos and sharing those and the following kept growing. And from there, I was like, should I start a YouTube channel? I was really on the fence because I only have so much time. So what I would do is I would build on the weekends and film everything. And then each night I would edit uh, some content to post on Instagram daily. And then the whole cycle would start again on Saturday morning. And I just didn't think I had time to do a full length video to post on YouTube. But then I was like, you know what, I'll try it. So I posted a couple and I was like, how can I, I'll never be able to do this on a regular basis. And then I started to look at the numbers and subscribers going up and you know, starting to see a little money from AdSense come in there after I was able to monetize. I was like, all right, maybe this isn't, maybe I can do this. But then when I got laid off and had to take this full time, I had had a, a, a big enough library of videos and subscribers that I was working with sponsors and I was able to get an agent that could help me uh, find sponsors that wanted to advertise in my videos. So as Instagram was growing, TikTok came in, started posting over there and growing a following there as well. And then, hey, there's Facebook too. So the bigger audience you grow on each platform, the more money you start to make. Uh, and then you can offer sponsors, hey, I'll give you an Instagram post, but I can also do one on Facebook and TikTok. So having large audiences on multiple platforms is also very appealing to companies who want to advertise with you. So it's very humbling and I wouldn't be able to do what I do without the support of them. My business right now, if I had to give a percentage, it's probably 70% content and 30% commissions. Um, the commissions drive the content, but the commissions don't necessarily drive my bank account. And another thing that's been so amazing and rewarding uh, being in this whole content game is working with companies that I've been using their tools for 15, 20 years and now they want to work with me. They want to support what I do, put some of their tools in my shop, pay me sometimes, which is always great. So it's weird how it's come full circle. Companies that you never thought would you would ever have anything to do with that you just buy stuff and now they've become part of your ecosystem. It's very rewarding. So I think a common misconception in the content game is when you're filming in your shop and everybody can see what's going on, you have all these expensive tools, everybody thinks you got everything for free. So they only see things through a social media lens. You know, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've uh, been investing, selling things, buying things, selling things, constantly upgrading my tools because the more experience you get, the more you realize that this tool isn't for me, so I'm very fortunate that I've been able to invest so much in my shop, but since I'm out here all the time, it's my hobby, it's my job, I want the best tools that I can afford, and they weren't all given to me. Some of them, as of recently, were, because as you start to work with sponsors and develop relationships, they want to put some of their tools in your shop for advertising. But I can tell you, nothing is free. There's always, <laughs> Not a catch, but they always want something in return, obviously, whether it's product placement or mentions or showing using the tool a lot, which I'm happy to do. See, poses, cords, always in there. You know, it's certainly not a free ride. And, and the reason companies want to work with you or send you their tools or be associated with you is because of all the hard work that I have put in that nobody sees. You know, people say, oh, it must be nice to have all that. Well, they weren't sitting next to me all those nights and weekends that I was out here building or in front of the computer editing until my eyes were bleeding. And all those hours that I had put in eventually started to bear fruit for me. 
it's not free. Everything I have in here I've worked for in one way or another, whether it was through buying it myself or uh, behind the scenes creating content and developing relationships with companies. I may not even know any people that just build furniture and make a living out of it. They all have different revenue streams, whether they write articles for magazines, they teach classes, they have online courses. You need to have multiple streams of revenue, I think, to make it in this business. So as far as online content, Instagram is usually sponsored posts. Uh, Facebook ads pays quite well. TikTok has started to pay well over there as well for placing ads. YouTube, obviously, AdSense revenue, as well as integrated, could be product placement or dedicated ad spots. I'm also a Lamello dealer, which is kind of a high-end tool that's made in Switzerland. I'm one of the only standalone dealers in the US. So a lot, that's a nice um, stream of revenue for me. Jason from Bourbon Moth and I have a podcast. That's another great stream of revenue through Patreon and through sponsors. Uh, I do sell plans. Um, the Lamello I mentioned, I recently designed a jig for that, um, that we 3D print. So that's available, which is another revenue stream. Regular Patreon, people are extremely generous in their support uh, because of all the free content that is created. They just, they love to help out and support you. It's very motivating knowing that other people are passionate about the content that I create and that people are learning from it and enjoying it. Hey! This product for the Lamello, which I print um, the black ones here. Um, my buddy Pete at Petrie's Workshop prints all the red ones, so we have multiple machines going around the clock. And it's just always good to diversify and have products that you can sell um, that create you know, you don't want to create something that there's really no need for. And there was nothing like this product on the market. So I think I have a little niche there. It's just getting going. We're really only a couple weeks into the launch, but it's going very well so far. And we'll see what happens. You know, I was just, so I was just listening to a podcast the other day where they were talking about inspiration versus influence. And after a half an hour of listening to them talk what they thought the differences were, I still don't know. <laughs> um, for me, inspiration is guys like my good friend Paul at Copper Pig Fine Woodworking, who integrates a lot of kind of brass and copper accents into his work, which is something I never would have done. Um, so I'm, I'm very inspired by his style as well as um, Eric Curtis and his approach to design. Took a class with him recently and I was like, ah, I didn't really like how my box was coming out. I was like, I think I'm gonna change this. He's like, no man, just let it be what it is. And you know, so he, he views every kind of mistake as another design opportunity or design challenge. And I take that to heart a lot. When I make a mistake or an encounter with a design challenge, I'll often think of people that are close to me and how they might approach it. And when I can't figure that out, then I call them. But inspiration can come from many different places. So this is called the Stadia Whiskey Cabinet. This cabinet was designed and built by me and my close friend, Keith Johnson, who you may be familiar with. The concept of the entire Stadia line of furniture and uh, smalls is this shape. And this shape, uh, in my opinion, is inherently eye-pleasing and quite contemporary. We have bifold doors, and the whole uh, theme that you can see starting with the brass epoxy inlay down the center is the Asanoa pattern, which is a, uh, the most classic Japanese pattern. But it's also found uh, on the inside in um, black epoxy, as well as the drawer, as well as the coasters. One of the things I like to do is frequently integrate metal into all my pieces. So you'll notice, uh, of course, the brass 
powder metal epoxy inlay, but of course all the brass hardware. I just feel like brass and black walnut play so well together. So at some point they'll be finished and we'll put them for sale. But I think this, uh, what I hope to show you is sort of the elements of design that Keith and I came up with together and we both uh, enjoy much of the same uh, design. So this is the tambour cabinet uh, with all this copper inlay that I did on the Shaper Origin. So Bluetooth radio inside, acoustic stink. It's really not uh, specifically built for a Bluetooth radio, but I had this kit and I wanted to build something around it. So that's what I did there. Tried a lot of new things on this. We got copper pins on the top. Um, this is just a a shellac based finish actually. Custom poles here, uh, black dye with some copper accents, and one of my favorite pieces. And it's sitting on a Sophia console table, which has been one of my most popular kind of reels on multiple platforms where there's a magnet hidden in here. And then that's how you open these drawers. and then it just sits up here so you don't lose it. So, not a fan of building smalls, but this is probably one of my favorite pieces I've ever built, which was in a class with Mike Pekovich. It's his tea box with these ebony accents, ebony pins, all out of white oak with a maple liner for different teas, uh, hand cut dovetails, and then also with Mike Pekovich, a little Kumiko, Again, one of my favorite little things. I'd never tried it before. So this is a walnut console table that actually is the subject of my online uh, woodworking course, the Modern Wood Academy. So it's got custom copper poles. We've got pin rabbits here with copper. Solid walnut everywhere. So there's a lot of different joinery techniques we go through here from pin rabbits, to miter joints obviously, to angled bridal joints, lots of stuff going on here. And what some of you might recognize from one of my videos where these <laughs> nightstands fell off the wall, uh, there's still a huge dent, I never fixed anything, huge dent in the drawer. So if you want to check out the YouTube video on those, it's pretty comical. A lot of people thought it was staged, I wish it was, then I wouldn't have damaged nightstands that are just sitting here. So this is the door to my new editing studio, podcast studio with custom cat door down here for Jerry and Lola. It opens right up so they can come in and out. It has this uh, privacy glass that goes off and on with a switch. That way if I'm recording, my wife, uh, it's kind of my on air button. And then this is my new office, which is Still a work in process. So this was a closet with wire shelving and who knows what in here. So we cleaned it all out, painted everything, and I just finished building this walnut floating desk here. Soft closed drawers and everything and have a little organizer up here. Once I move everything in, monitors on the wall. I added some trim up here as well. We're gonna do some floating shelves in here and some cat beds and other things going on. So I want to make it nice and cozy. So hoping to have this um, you know, fully outfitted in the next month or year based on my usual schedule. Oh, I mean, I can talk about the cats a little just because they're like... I figured at some point we'd introduce the cats. Yeah. So it was interesting because four years ago we adopted two cats, a brother and a sister. And if you've ever had cats before, they don't like loud noises. They sometimes just like to sleep all day and they'll hang out a little bit, but they kind of want to be, they're a little independent. And when we first got these two, Jerry would sleep under, I have a little old bookcase in here, and he would just sleep under there all day. And with all the noise going on, it never bothered him. And then he started to come out more and hang out and lay on my table saw or on the bench and just sleep and just nothing bothered him. And he's become Shopcat Jerry and Shopcat Lola. They're out here all the time with me. 
but it's also, it's a weird sense of, I have company out here. You know, I don't have employees, but I got these two cats that kind of want to be in everything. You'll see them both in all of my videos. And I don't know how, but they just instinctively know to stay away from a running tool. And it's just nice to have somebody else in the show. I mean, Jerry and I have had long, deep conversations. They're usually one way, uh, but I feel like one day he's gonna say something and it'll all be worth it. Ultimately, what you want as I get older here is to have more passive income streams. So products, I do have an online woodworking course um, where we build a walnut console table. So I'd love to film some more courses and have them online. So, you know, people are buying these and it's just going on in the background. Um, so while you're in here building furniture, you know, your content that you've created already is out there making money for you as well. I may eventually want to teach, um, maybe at some schools, um, show them how I build certain pieces. That could be down the road. And as long as this content thing still keeps happening, um, I'm going to keep making as much content as possible. There's two goals really. One is to please the client because they're paying you to build something that they can't get anywhere else. So that is really the paramount. That's the ultimate goal is when you deliver something and they are completely happy with their purchase. You know, hopefully you want to over deliver um, what you would promise them. The other goal is, is a personal goal for me is to grow as a furniture maker with a new technique or something that I've just never tried before that I'm going to be able to take that experience and bring it to another project. And satisfaction, really, like I don't want to sit back and I don't want to build, that's, I don't want to build the same thing all the time. To me, there's zero satisfaction or reward in that. So when I build a brand new piece that I kind of designed from the ground up, and you know, use these two hands to build and craft, and at the end I can sit back and look at it, Man, it feels good. It feels really good. And then after all that, then you deliver it and you see the clients, uh, the look on their face, that just is really the cherry on top. But it, it becomes sometimes a little overwhelming being out here so much. But I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, it's really... There's nothing else that fuels me that like, oh man, I gotta go water skiing today. Like I need it. It just, this is, this is my happy place. And even if I'm out here, just cleaning up, tidying up, not even really building anything, it's just comfortable being here and it makes me happy. Mm -hmm.